I too want to offer my welcome to everybody here, especially our visitors. We're thankful that you're with us. Uh, it's nice to see Jan here as well. We certainly are mindful of Elmo and we certainly do miss him. And we're praying for uh, Jan and, and the rest of the family as well. Our topic today is dealing with a concept that has really kind of risen in popularity, popularity especially over the last couple of years as it pertains to the applications of Sabbath and the new moon in considering the worship of the Lord as Christians. And the argument is that under the old law, there were aspects of Sabbaths and new moons that were to be observed, and those have not changed. And that we need to continue to uh, consider our days of worship according to the way the Jews did under the Jewish calendar and make sure that we are serving God as we should. And there's been a lot of different variations of this concept. Some are convinced that Sunday was originally sat, supposed to be Sabbath and that somebody changed it along the way in the years since the New Testament church was established and that we're actually supposed to meet on Sabbath day to worship. Others are convinced that both Sabbath and the Lord's Day are uh, important to worship, gather to worship. And then some think what actually what is the first day of the week or the seventh day of the week isn't actually Sunday or Saturday, but it's simply based on the Jewish month at the current time, and that each month is going to be different, and so we can't go by the names of the week, days of the week. And so I want to talk a little bit about that today, especially uh, as it applies today as well, given what a lot of people in our religious society uh, are gathering together uh, to do today, given that it's uh, Easter and people put a lot of religious significance on that. And we'll talk about that in just a minute. When we talk about the Jewish calendar, the Jewish calendar both was and continues to be lunisolar, which means that uh, their months are marked by the beginning of each new moon. Now, new moons have, their, the moon has a phase, and there's about 29 and a half days but from new moon to new moon. The moment you begin to see the sliver of the new moon each month, that begins the month of the Jewish calendar. Uh, each year is marked by the passage of the sun through the sky, and once it returns back to its original state, that's a solar year. That's why it's called a lunisolar calendar. And connected to that calendar is a seven-day week. Uh, first day or uh, day one all the way through day seven. And there's been a lot of, of discussion also about the seven-day week. What's interesting is that the seven-day week, there is no original beginning that can be found in the historical record. Uh, in fact, they go to ancient Babylon and then even further back to Samaria and as far as people can tell, aside from a few uh, civilizations, kind of random civilizations that tried to change things up, the seven-day week has been ingrained since antiquity. And it has, uh, there, again, there is no beginning in the historical record that people, that historians can point to to say this is when it started, uh, which I think is interesting. And the numeration of the workday, again, Sunday through Saturday, this is independent of the lunisola calendar. Now what we mean by that is it works just like our calendar does. So right now we're April 9th, it's a Sunday. April 9th next year will not be a Sunday because of how the days are lined up. It is concurrent, but it is not dependent on the calendar. For instance, this is actually, you can't see it very well, but this is actually the Jewish calendar for the current time we're in. For the Jews, this is the month of Nisan, also known, as, also known as Abib in the Old Testament. Right now, this is the 18th day of Nisan, April 9th, but it's Sunday. And each month, the days stay the same in terms of the, the continuation or the numeration of them, Sunday through Saturday, over and over and over and over again. But the months of the Jewish calendar change based on, the, uh, each passage of the month changes based on the new moon. And we see this actually mentioned in the Old Testament multiple times, numerous occasions. In fact, 
the beginning of each new month was holy. In fact, the Lord commanded that certain things be done on the new moon. In Numbers chapter 28 and in verse 11, in the giving of the law, God says, At the beginnings of your months you shall present a burnt offering to the Lord, two young bulls, one ram, and seven lambs in their first year without blemish. And he continues describing all of the sacrifices that are offered. And then at the end of verse 14, this is the burnt offering for each month throughout the months of the year. And so over and over again, we have example of this being referenced in 2 Chronicles chapter 31. 2 Chronicles chapter 31, we see this being brought up again. Notice with me, 2 Chronicles chapter 31, and starting in verse 2, this is talking about Hezekiah and how that Hezekiah, he's appointing the divisions of the priests and the Levites according to their divisions. And in verse 3, the king also appointed a portion of his possessions for the burnt offerings, for the morning and evening burnt offerings, the burnt offerings for the Sabbaths and the new moons, and the set feasts as it is written in the law of the Lord. So referencing the Sabbath and particularly the new moons going back to Numbers 28, and it's even mentioned actually even earlier than that in Numbers chapter 10, regarding the sacrifices that were to be made for the new moon. And then earlier in 2 Chronicles, this time in chapter 2, 2 Chronicles chapter 2, starting in verse 3, as Solomon is preparing for, to build the temple of the Lord, Solomon sent to Hiram, king of Tyre, saying, As you have dealt with my father, or with David my father, and sent him cedars to build himself a house to dwell in, so deal with me. Verse 4, Behold, I am building a temple for the name of the Lord my God, to dedicate it to him, to burn before him sweet incense for the continual showbread, for the burnt offerings morning and evening, on the Sabbaths, on the new moons, and on the set feasts of the Lord our God, this is an ordinance forever to Israel. Now, we see reference to, that Solomon makes according to the ordinance of God to Israel regarding the observation of the Sabbaths and the new moons and the set feasts. Of course, you have your Feast of the Unleavened Bread, the Feast of Booths or Weeks, uh, and then the Feast of Tabernacles as well that are being referenced. And so all of this leads us to the understanding that the beginning of each new month, the, the observation of the new moon was to bring about, had that set rotation of the months according to the new moon. And each new moon prompted a sacrifice to God. It was remembered that each month was, in its essence, a blessing from God. In Isaiah chapter 1, we even have reference to the fact that God was getting tired of how Israel was offering up sacrifices to him in a way that was uh, not what he wanted. For instance, in Isaiah chapter 1, we have the Lord speaking regarding Judah, and he says in verse 13, Bring no more futile sacrifices. Incense is an abomination to me. The new moons, the Sabbaths, and the calling of assemblies, I cannot endure iniquity and the sacred meeting. Your new moons and your appointed feasts my soul hates. They are a trouble to me. I am weary of bearing them. God, certainly we have example after example, like in Malachi, how that God was upset with the priests because of the sacrifices they were offering. They were offering the lame and the blind. But here we have reference in Isaiah that the, what God had commanded, the sacrifices of the new moons and so forth, they had become uh, a weary to the Lord because the people's heart wasn't in it. They weren't observing it as they should. Now, of course, we also know that the Sabbath day was also to be kept holy. We see that in Exodus chapter 20. And in verse 8, part of the Ten Commandments. And of course, there's multiple references throughout the Old Testament regarding the Sabbath day. But this all goes back to Genesis chapters 1 and 2, describing the creation. 
and how that from the first day to the sixth day, God created the heavens and the earth, and he created all things that are in it, including us. And then on the seventh day, God rested. And in fact, the term Sabbath, it means a rest. And that's why the Sabbath day is a part of, uh, presumably, even under the patriarchal law, they had a Sabbath. But especially under the old law, the Mosaical law, the Sabbath day was ingrained in the, in the law to keep it holy. There were certain Sabbath days in which it was to be recognized, the burnt offerings and so forth that were to be offered. But there were certain Sabbath days that fell on feast days. And that's what was called High Sabbath, for instance, as was the case at Passover before Jesus was, uh, was uh, betrayed, uh, that it was called a High Sabbath. Now, here's what we want to consider this morning. Issues regarding, we're going to talk about Sabbath first, and then kind of talk about the new moons as well. Because as I said, there are some people, religious individuals, and I think they sincerely want to do what's right, but there's entire articles that you can find online in which they're attempting to make the case that the Sabbath day was, for instance, originally, or, or the, that Sunday was originally the seventh day, the Sabbath day. But then it got all mixed up when the Gregorian calendar got instituted, which is technically kind of what we use, the Gregorian calendar or variation of it, uh, that Sunday isn't on the Sabbath day like it should be. Instead, it's on the first day of the week. And, and so it got all me messed up. I want you to consider what Vines has to say about that. Vines says, as it pertains to talking about the first day of the week and Sabbath, especially as in his definition on the Sabbath, he says, for the first three centuries of the Christian era, the first day of the week was never confounded with the Sabbath. The confusion of the Jewish and Christian institutions, that is Sabbath and the first day of the week, was due to declension from apostolic teaching. That term declension being used here in context is the deterioration or the going away from. And so Vines describes how that for the first 300 years after the church was established, there was no confusion about the Sabbath day and the first day of the week. The Christians met on the first day of the week, and that was never in doubt over the first 300 years. But then, as people started going away from, and even really before that, people started going away from the apostles' teaching, but the first time we really start seeing that kind of confounding of the first day of the week and the Sabbath day is about 300 years afterwards. I think that's a really interesting thing that uh, Vines brings up. But then people will argue, even if that's the case, shouldn't Christians still observe the Sabbath? Because God says to observe the Sabbath, keep the Sabbath day holy. Well, it's interesting to me that after the events of Acts 2, that is the, uh, the establishment of the church, Christians, people are now being baptized into Christ, into the, uh, the church that belongs to Christ, into his body. They're being added to the kingdom and after Acts chapter 2, there are only seven times where the term Sabbath comes up throughout the New Testament. Just seven times. And in every single one of those examples, it's always in reference to the Jews who were gathering on the Sabbath. There are times in Acts chapter 17, Acts 16, Acts 18, where Paul would go into the synagogue on the Sabbath to teach in Acts chapter 16, Lydia was gathering with ladies outside, um, uh, outside of the city of Philippi along the river because there was apparently no synagogue in Philippi. And so the Jewish ladies, that's where they would gather to pray. Paul, and, and Luke even makes record of this, that Paul and, and they went out to the river on the Sabbath where they were gathering to pray. At no time do we see any example of the New Testament saints observing Sabbath, Jewish or Gentile. No reference is made to it. Nowhere is keeping the Sabbath day wholly commanded by God in the New Testament after the church has been established. Now, surely the observation of Sabbath by the Jewish brethren still continued. And, I, and, and certainly, as we're going to talk about, I'm sure Paul saw nothing wrong with that. But continuing to maintain that it was first a cultural thing that they did. It had nothing to do with being faithful to the law of God anymore. But also, there was the civil law to consider, in, especially in Judea, 
where the Sanhedrin still controlled the day-to-day laws of the people of Judea, observing the Sabbath would have been a part of the civil law. And so I'm sure Jewish brethren continued to observe the Sabbath, but they no longer did it because it was commanded under the law of God, because they recognized that they are now under the law of Christ. Now, that leads us to the consideration of the Sabbaths and the new moons. Because many claim that we're not counting our days right, that we're not counting the days of our weeks properly, that we're not worshiping on the days that God said so, and then because of that, or maybe in spite of that, they kind of say, really, there's no set day that we're to worship God. We're to worship God every day. Well, certainly, just to make it clear, we, can, we should be worshiping God every day, both in our prayers and in our conduct, our example that we set forward to everyone else. But as far as when the brethren gathered to worship, gathered, for instance, to take the Lord's Supper, that's a different situation. That's a different story. But a lot of times what these people do is they kind of they kind of conflate the concept of still being under the law by the need to observe the Jewish calendar, including Sabbath. They incorrectly claim that the days of the week start over with each new month. So every time a new moon begins, no matter if it's Thursday or Friday, all of a sudden it's Sunday again, the day that they find the new moon or see the new moon, because the days start over each month. And that's not the case. Nowhere in any of my searching did I find any example of that. The calendar I showed you uh, actually came from, uh, let me see if I can remember, uh, wearethejews.com or wearethejews.org, I think it was. Anyway, describing what the Jews believe, kind of their, their, how their calendar works is how, where I got that calendar from and so forth. But it, it shows that, e- and even in antiquity, even in the Old Testament, they didn't, the days didn't start over. They continue just as it does for us. That being the case, consider what Paul says in Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2, start with me in verse 13. Ephesians 2 and in verse 13, as Paul writes to Christians who were Gentiles, okay, these are individuals who were not brought up necessarily in the oracles of God or the Old Testament. These were, had been Gentiles who had been brought near by the blood of Christ, he says in verse 13. In fact, earlier in verse 11 and 12, he says, you were once afar off. You had no hope. But now in verse 13, in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself, verse 14, is our peace, who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of separation. Now, a lot of times people apply this as being the wall of separation between us and God. But I want you to consider the fact that that may not be what he's talking about. Because in the very next verse, verse 15, he describes the two becoming one man. Verse 15, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, that is the law of commandments, contained in ordinances so as to create in himself one new man from the two, thus making peace, that he might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross. Notice we're not talking about this middle wall of separation separating God and man. We're talking about the middle wall of separation that separated Jew and Gentile under the old law. The old law made that designation. It made that separation between Jew and Gentile and kept them separate. That being the case, verse 15, Paul says that Jesus has abolished in his flesh that hostility. That's that means of separation. The law created that hostility between Jew and Gentile, created that separation. Notice he then defines what it was Jesus abolished. That law of commandments contained in ordinances so as to create in himself one new man from the two. In other words, now everyone isn't just a Jew or a Gentile. Everyone can simply be a Christian. We use the phrases Jewish Christian or Gentile Christian to kind of help us establish context for things. But in the end, Paul, on numerous occasions, the New Testament writers say, there is no Jew, there is no Greek. There, in terms of our soul, there is no male or female. There is no slave or free. All are one in Christ Jesus. 
It is to that that Paul's referring here in verse 15. So as to create in himself one new man from the two, thus making peace. Jew and Gentile both have to take the same route to salvation. Both have to be baptized. Verse 16, that he might reconcile them both to God. The term reconcile here is a guilty party reconciling to an innocent. Well, God did nothing wrong against us. We're the ones who've done wrong against him. Christ is our advocate. He is our intercessor. He is the one through whom we're able to reconcile to God through the cross, thereby putting to death the enmity. In Galatians chapter 3, Galatians chapter 3 and in verse 24, once again, Paul references, in fact, Galatians 3 and 4 especially deal with concepts of the old law in particular. But notice in verse 24, he's describing the faith that is to come, that faith that is prophesied about, that faith that now has come in Christ Jesus. And then he contrasts that to the law in verse 24. Therefore, the law was our tutor to bring us to Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But then he says in verse 25, after faith has come, we're no longer under a tutor. We have no more need of the old law. It served its purpose. In fact, the old law was built in with an expiration date, the coming of Jesus and ultimately the the establishing of the new covenant, as was prophesied by God in the law itself. That when Christ came, when what Christ would accomplish, especially in his death, the, in the establishment of the new covenant, would put away the old law. And Paul says, we're not under a tutor anymore. Once faith has come, we're no longer under a tutor. He might as well say we're no longer under the old law. Because that's what he's saying in verse 24. And then in Galatians chapter 6 and in verse 2, Paul makes reference to uh, bearing one another's burdens and so fulfilling the law of Christ. In James chapter 1 and in chapter 2, James references a phrase regarding uh, the perfect law of liberty. In fact, in James chapter 2, so act and so do as those who will be judged by the perfect law of liberty. It doesn't say by the old law or the law of Moses, by the law of liberty. And the Mosaical law at no time was ever referenced as the law of liberty. What we find is that the old law has been fulfilled and it's been put away. So those trying to hearken back to counting of Sabbaths, to the observation of new moons, attempting to reorganize the days of the week uh, in accordance with an incorrect assumption about how those were numbered, they're establishing this from a false premise. Their belief thought process that brings in aspects of the Old Testament and makes them binding in the New Testament. In fact, that's one of the reasons why Paul wrote the letter to the Galatians, is that there were Judaizing teachers, people teaching from the old law, particularly circumcision being one thing, and attempting to bind it on the Gentile brethren of Galatia. And Paul says, that's not how this works. We have to understand that if we are to go, if we were to hearken back, the the inconsistency here is if you're going to hearken back to the, the Sabbath and the new moons and so forth, then you've got to hearken back to all of it. Now there, in fact, I even read an article that describes, here's why we no longer offer sacrifices, because that's the example we most commonly bring up is, well, why don't you you offer animal sacrifices? Well, Jesus offered the sacrifice for us. That's why we don't have to anymore. Okay, I'll give you that. But why not circumcision? Why isn't it commanded? In fact, why is it specified both in Acts 15 as well as the book of Galatians? Why is it specified that circumcision no longer does anything? Circumcision of the flesh doesn't save anyone. Why is that unless the old law has been done away with? Many, here's the kind of key component to this. Many misapply the words that Paul offers in Colossians chapter 2. In fact, several articles that I read appealed to Colossians 2 as justification for hearkening back to the Sabbaths and the new moons. And yet, the irony is, is Paul's doing actually the exact opposite of justifying that. In Colossians chapter 2, 
Notice, starting in verse 4, Paul, as he's offering up uh, his commendation for the brethren to recognize their faith and their understanding, he wants them to continue to be established in the understanding of God. He says in verse 4, I say this, lest anyone should deceive you with persuasive words. Now, to kind of help establish our context of chapter 2, one of the things we're going to see throughout the rest of the chapter is that Paul is concerned about deceptive teachers, individuals who were teaching things as it pertained to, for now we're going to say something, obviously, that he's concerned about that's trying, attempting to deceive the minds of the Colossians. Well, who's teaching what and why? And why is it wrong? Why shouldn't they uh, allow themselves to be deceived here? Paul says, I say this for the express reason that I'm concerned some are trying to talk you into something that's wrong. All right, we'll jump down to verse 6. As you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith as you've been taught, abounding in it with thanksgiving. Paul's laying the groundwork to show them that you have everything you need. You have been taught what you need to know. You are established and rooted as long as you're in Christ. Beware, verse 8, lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. Notice Moses isn't even mentioned. The law of Moses isn't mentioned. The Jews aren't mentioned. But notice who is emphasized. Christ is. Jesus is. Verse 9, for in him, in Jesus, dwells all the fullness of the Godhead, the divine nature, bodily. And you are complete, verse 10, you're complete in him, who is the head of all principality and power. You have everything you need. You're complete. You're grounded in Christ. You don't need anything else. So then go to verse 11. In him, you were also circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, by putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, in which you also were raised with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. And you being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. Now again, he is writing primarily to Gentile brethren, brethren who didn't grow up with the old law being taught to them, who didn't grow up being circumcised. But notice how all of a sudden, starting in verse 11, he starts talking about circumcision. He talks about circumcision made without hands. He talks about being circumcised in Christ, through baptism, verse 11 and 12. Why would he talk about that unless what he referred to back in verse 4, those who were attempting to deceive and to teach those things that uh, were not required under the law. As we see in Acts 15, these Judaizing teachers attempting to teach Gentile brethren, you must be obedient to the law of Moses in order to become a Christian. You must be circumcised under the law in order to be saved. And Paul says, the circumcision you have has nothing to do with circumcision of the flesh, it's of the spirit, that which is without hands. Then in verse 14, Paul says, having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us, he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it, to the cross. This is very parallel to what Paul says in Ephesians chapter 2. There's a lot of similarities and parallels here. Earlier he said has, he has abolished this writing of requirements that created that separation between Jew and Gentile. Here he says he's wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us. Not to say God has eliminated law. He's eliminated old law and given the context you link it directly to the old law regarding circumcision and perhaps other aspects of the Jewish law. But that's what Paul's emphasizing. In Hebrews chapter 7 and in verse 11, the Hebrew writer makes this case very clear. 
Hebrews chapter 7, starting in verse 11, the Hebrew writer says, Therefore, if perfection were through the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, this is talking about the old law, what further need was there that another priest should rise according to the order of Melchizedek, talking about Jesus, and not be called according to the order of Aaron? Verse 12, For the priesthood being changed which is to say the Levitical priesthood has been put away, the order of Melchizedek has now taken back its precedence of necessity, verse 12, there is also a change of the law. The Hebrew writer outright makes it clear that the law has changed, that the old law no longer has bearing. Why? Verse 13, for he of whom these things are spoken, talking about Jesus, belongs to another tribe from which no man has officiated at the altar. It is evident that our Lord arose from Judah, verse 14, of which tribe Moses spoke nothing concerning priesthood. So how can Jesus be a priest according to the order of Melchizedek? Well, it was prophesied the order of Melchizedek existed even before the old law did. And so that order preempts the Levitical priesthood. And so for the priesthood being changed, there's a change of the law. The law changed. In verse 18, For on the one hand there is the annulling of the former commandment because of its weakness and unprofitableness. Talking about the old law. For the law, verse 19, made nothing perfect. On the other hand, there is the bringing in of a better hope through which we draw near to God. Talking about the law in Christ. Verse 22, By so much more, Jesus has become a surety of a better covenant. No, one, one outside of the old law. A better covenant with better promises. Then, going back to Colossians chapter 2, Paul goes on to say in verse 16, So let no one judge you in food or in drink, in regarding, or, or regarding a festival or a new moon or Sabbaths. Now this is the text that some of these articles point to to say, see, Paul says that we are to observe these things and no one is to condemn you for doing so. No one is to condemn you for observing Sabbaths and the new moon. But what was the context again? Paul's concerned about Judaizing teachers among the Colossians. He's concerned about people trying to deceive these brethren into incorporating aspects of the old law that have been done away with, that have been wiped out. Well, what do we know were part of those aspects of the old law? Festivals, feasts, and new moons and Sabbaths. That's part of the old law. So what Paul says here in verse 16 is not... Let no one judge you for doing these things. It's let no one condemn you for not doing those things. Because while the Jews, particularly the, Jew, the, the, the Jews who were not Christians, continued to observe the feasts and the festivals and the new moons and Sabbaths because they still were following the old law, the Gentile Christians knew that's not binding on us. It's not binding on anyone anymore. And even the Jewish brethren had to understand they could, especially as it pertained to culture and civil law, they could still observe new moons and Sabbaths, that's fine. But no longer could they consider it as binding under the law of Christ. Because the law of Christ is not the old law. And so the very argument that some of these people try to make in saying that we still are supposed to do it is actually the exact opposite of what Paul's saying. Verse 17 these things, talking about the festivals and the feasts and the new moons and the Sabbaths, these are a shadow of things to come, but the substance is of Christ. Now, it's interesting that Paul uses this phrase, these are shadows of things to come. Because that's the same phrase that the Hebrew writer uses in Hebrews chapter 10 and in verse 1. Hebrews chapter 10 and in verse 1, in talking about the day of atonement, in talking about the sacrifices, the Hebrew writer says, For the law, talking about the old law, having a shadow of the good things to come, and not the very image of the things, 
can never, with these same sacrifices, which they offer continually, year by year, Day of Atonement, make those who approach perfect. Those sacrifices can't make anybody perfect. Verse 4, or verse 2, for then, they would, or for then would they not have ceased to be offered? If it could forgive sins, if it could make somebody perfect, then what's the need for it to do it every year? For the worshipers, once purified, would have no more consciousness of sins. Verse 3, but in those sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins every year. Verse 4, it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sin. Not possible. It could purify the flesh, Hebrews 9, but it could not purify the soul or spirit. It could not take away sin. As a result, the law had only a shadow of the good things to come. It wasn't the substance. Which is why it's so important to note that from Colossians 2 and in verse, 6, uh, verse 17, the same thing is being applied to feasts and festivals and new moons and Sabbaths. These are shadows of things to come. Well, I don't want shadows. I want the substance. Oh, what does Paul say is the substance? Christ is the substance. Therefore, verse 18, let no one cheat you of your reward, taking delight in false humility and worship of angels, intruding into those things which he has not seen vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind. It's indicative that we're still describing Judaizing teachers, particularly that phrase, worship of angels. It's unfortunate in the New King James that it's translated that way because the term worship here literally means the religion of. In fact, it's the same term that we find James use uh, regarding true and undefiled religion is this. Well, what's being described is hierarchies of angels, invocations of of angels, even of named angels. And some of the Jews were obsessed with what you would call the religion of angels. They were obsessed with the hierarchies of which angels are better than the others. They were obsessed. In fact, if you look through the history of the Maccabean revolt, many of the Maccabees soldiers invoked the names of angels before they would go up and, and attempt to, to rebel. It's interesting, Paul uses that phrase here. Because the Hebrew writer, in Hebrews chapter 1 and chapter 2, both those chapters, the first two chapters of the Hebrew letter, all deal with why Jesus is better than the angels. Now, what would be the point of that? What would be the point of describing why Jesus is better than the angels? For two full chapters, keep in mind to whom or what the audience is of the Hebrew letter. These are Jewish brethren, some of whom have gone back to the old law. Obviously, there is still, even at the time of the writing of Hebrews, which was around 64-ish A.D., even at that time, there was still an obsession with this religion of angels. Not necessarily worship, but this delving into the angels and delving into the, their supposed hierarchies, which there aren't any, of invoking names of angels. But then he goes on to say in verse 20, Therefore, if you died with Christ from the basic principles of the world, why, as though living in the world, do you subject yourselves to regulations, as he says in verse 22, according to the commandments and doctrines of men? Now, I want you to note that that's the same thing that he said earlier regarding these traditions that he referred to as he uh, describes regarding these uh, in verse 8, Beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit according to the tradition of men. Well, at this point, as soon as the, the old law was put away, what is it now for those who continue to follow it? It's now a tradition of men. That's what the old law is. Now, it is the very thing that Paul warns about here in verse 22, the commandments and doctrines of men. Why? Because God isn't commanding you to follow the old law. He's commanded you to follow Christ, to follow his law, the law of Christ. 
The old law has been done away with. It's been wiped out. It's been abolished. It's been fulfilled. Verse 23. These things indeed have an appearance of wisdom. In self-imposed religion, false humility and neglect of the body but are of no value against the indulgence of the flesh. Now, some of the very arguments that people make regarding observing the Sabbaths, regarding the new moons, regarding the festivals like Pentecost or uh, the uh, uh, unloved, Feast of Unleavened Bread, Feast of Weeks, or even in re- the religious cultures today, Christian religious cultures, Easter, for instance, none of which do we find commanded in the New Testament. If Pentecost, or if Passover when Jesus was, uh, uh, for, well, was uh, uh, betrayed, if that was a high Sabbath, then people recognize today in religious circles as being a high Sunday or a high Lord's Day. And yet, we never find reference to those things in the New Testament. We talk about these new moons and Sabbaths and all of the confusion that people can start having once they start kind of falling down that rabbit hole trying to determine when are we supposed to worship? Are we supposed to include Old Testament stuff? Are we supposed to, when, how do we count the days? God made it easy for us. Especially when you compare to all the things that the people under the old law had to remember, all the days that were holy, the restrictions on how far they could travel. God made it easy for us. There's one day that is special to the Christian, and that's the Lord's Day. Today is no more and no less special than any other Lord's Day. It's the Lord's Day. And as we talked about six months ago with the importance of Sunday, we talked about, oh, 40 weeks or so ago at the beginning of what people call the Lenten sacrifice or the Lenten Lenten period. Well, Guess what? The Lord's Day, that reference in Revelation chapter 1 and in verse 10, that term is only used twice in the New Testament with regard to that possessive, the Lord's Day. It's used in Revelation 1 verse 10, the Lord's Day being the first day of the week in the New Testament, and the Lord's Supper in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. That term, the Lord's, literally means it belongs to the Lord. It is His. And it's not our prerogative to change that up. To decide, well, we should be able to worship any day. We should be able to gather to worship on Saturday. or Well, we can gather. We do so on Wednesday to worship. But there is only a special day on which we're to be able to take the Lord's Supper. A day in which we have to gather as commanded by the Lord. That's the lesson for you this morning. Something for us to think about, especially given that today is Easter and that you have people all over the country, all over the world, who put special importance on this day and on Christmas. Those might be the two days that they go to Mass or they go to to church in some form or fashion. Because as long as I hit those two days, God will be happy with me. The birth of Jesus and the death of Jesus. We see neither being celebrated or acknowledged in the New Testament What we see acknowledged in the New Testament is the memorial of the Lord's Supper, which reminds us every week of the Lord's death. And the fact that he died also reminds us that he was born in order to die for us. And in dying, he was raised. And after he was raised, he ascended. And now being ascended, he waits until that day when the Lord tells him to go and redeem the saved, those who have been faithful to him, to usher in the judgment day. The question we have to ask ourselves is, are we ready? Are we prepared? God has given us everything we need to worship him in spirit and in truth. He's given us everything we need that pertains to life and godliness. Paul tells the Colossians, you are complete. You are grounded and rooted in him. As long as you hold fast to the head, which is Christ. Are we prepared to meet the Lord in judgment? If we're not a Christian this morning, we're not ready. Because without being baptized and have our sins washed away, being added to the body of Christ, we have no hope come Judgment Day. 
For those of us who are Christians, if we're currently in sin, living in sin, haven't repented of our sins, we also have no hope. We can say to ourselves all we want to, well, I'm a Christian, God will make an exception for me. That's not how it's going to work. There is no partiality with God. If you are a Christian, then you know better. We need to make sure our lives, our states are right. Maybe you just need encouragement. Maybe you need edification. We're here for you to help you do that, to, have, to receive that edification and encouragement, to pray to the Lord for strength. Whatever the case is, consider your state this morning. and Come forward as we stand and sing.